Hello, everyone. Uh, the music and opera you just have heard is curated by Dr. Nicholas Ern. The image is provided by my, uh, Dr. Michael Williams. So that shows you already that today we will have a collaborative lecture on Chinese uh, opera in Australia. So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Institute for Australian and Chinese Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. My name is Jing Han. I'm the director of this institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge that our institute is on Parramatta South Campus, which we can't access, but it is on the country of the Darug people of the Darug Nation. And we like to acknowledge their ancestors who have been the traditional owners of their country for thousands of years. We also want to acknowledge and pay our respect to the First Nations elders of the countries we are all sitting on today, past, present, and emerging. The Chinese Australian History Series 2 has one lecture a month. All previous lectures are recorded and can be accessed on our website under Chinese Australian History tab. Last lecture was given by Dr. Drew Cotto on the history of Chinese Youth League in Australia. It was a very interesting talk and a very eye-opening. And it adds another layer or aspect to the diversity of Chinese migration. Drew mentioned an interesting and surprising link to me between the Chinese Youth League and the Chinese Opera in his talk. Today's lecture will be on Chinese Opera in Australia. Uh, Professor Michael Williams, graduated from Hong Kong University, is an expert in Chinese Australian history and a founding member of the Chinese Australian Historical Society. And Michael has been the adjunct professor of this institute and delivered the whole set of lectures in series one. Dr. Nicholas Ern is the research fellow of this institute. He received his PhD from Australian National University Nick is an ethnomusicologist, a composer, a, a performer, and he plays a, quite a few music instruments, arhu, hulusi, uh, piano, and a few, a few others. And uh, his specialty is in Chinese sacred music, Chinese classical music, and Chinese folk music, and composition. And his research area is in ethnomusicologist, tracking Chinese history in Australia. Um, also today, I would just like, like, would like to let you know that um, we are using live transcript function in Zoom, which is newly added, but it's working really well. If you like to see the captions, you can just go down to live transcript, uh, the, the button, and then turn on to show captions. Uh, just a reminder that captions are generated by AI-enabled speech recognition engine. So the accuracy is not 100%, but I have to say, being an expert in captioning and subtitling, the accuracy is quite high. Um, still, it's not entirely 100% accurate. Um, as, but that will help people with hearing impaired, um, you know, um, people with hearing impaired. So that's a very helpful function. Uh, as always, during the lecture, you can post your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And at the end of the lecture, I will read out the questions from you for Michael and Nick to respond. Now, please welcome Professor Michael Williams and Dr. Nicholas Ahn. Uh, thank you, Jin, uh, and uh, welcome Nicholas also, uh, my colleague in this, uh, in this talk today on Chinese opera in Australia, and we've subtitled it uh, Not Just Chinese, because we're going to emphasize some of the diversity uh, within, that, uh, within that label Chinese, and particularly uh, even in, in the narrow, relatively narrow top, topic of opera. So I just want to begin by explaining a little bit about this picture here, the City Hall picture uh, that you see here. But this was a building that stood in Elizabeth Street, uh, Sydney, at the end of the 19th, early 20th century. And as you can see, if you look carefully, there's some Chinese writing on the front. And what it was, was actually the rehearsal hall uh, for a Chinese uh, opera troupe that uh, was developed in Sydney. So not an imported uh, troupe, but one that actually grew up from Sydney, uh, developed and practiced there, didn't perform there, but actually performed around the corner in some of the mainstream theaters in Castle Ray Street. And I wanna emphasize this as an aspect of Australian history, 
which is largely forgotten. And I'll come back to that theme of forgotten hidden history or whitewashed history um, later in the lecture. So in the next slide, you'll see uh, there's a couple of, um, so Nicholas, yes, thank you, Nicholas, sorry. Uh, in the next slide, we can see that there's a couple of uh, troops mentioned here. Uh, the Li Yao Tian Ban is the one that actually had that hall. They were a cooperative, cooperative group in Sydney. Uh, there's another one called the Bu Yu Tin Company. Uh, and that's a couple of references to that company. Uh, one is that the, the actors have been trained in Sydney. So as I emphasize, they were Sydney trained uh, people or, or Australian trained people in the opera company. And also they talked about in another uh, uh, analysis, the chief performers came from China direct to Sydney. So I'm assuming that there was a mixture of things going on here that they did have performers coming in from China uh, to tour or to perform. Uh, as well as uh, drawing on the local community. And this is something that I think it happened uh, right throughout, uh, throughout the history. So there's again, another emphasis there. Uh, so just to give us an overview uh, of what we're talking about today. Uh, so Chinese Opera in Australia has a, a nearly continuous history in Australia from the 1850s until the present. Uh, though there are some ups and downs within that which we'll, we'll go about. So we'll give a bit of an outline history uh, and I'll also be emphasizing this idea of why uh, some of this history has been forgotten or whitewashed. Uh, and we'll talk about the role of diversity, uh, particularly identity, Chineseness, and some of the transnational connections uh, that have been there. And, and my colleague Nicholas will also uh, be talking about uh, similar themes. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, uh, Ting, for the wonderful introduction. Um, welcome everyone. And so, whereas Michael's work is historical, uh, mine is ethnographic and fieldwork based. And uh, my contribution to this talk um, is the living tradition of opera, which is performed in present day Sydney, of course. And so through by, from informed history, I work with contemporaneous people, in particular, the group known as the Teochu, a cultural linguistic Han Chinese group in Sydney's far west which, as you know, is an LGA of concern <laughs> right now. Um, so the community um, hosts and produces annual Teochew operatic productions, which involves um, which involve local performers and specially invited guests from Swatow, which is the, you know, the historic cultural Teochew center in China there. Um, operatic arias from epic legends and heartbreaking romances are performed for the enjoyment of community members. Um, and just, um, just so you're aware, the Jew Opera has all the standard conventions, characteristics and costumes and characters of the other operatic traditions from China too. So our research certainly focuses on the theme of migration. We will also look at the role of women. Um, and interestingly too, um, decline is a topic that engages um, with us, the issue of decline and also um, new pathways into the future through transformation or you know, for want of a better word, evolution. All right, thanks. Over to you, Michael. Thanks, Nick. And uh, so what, uh, first thing I want to emphasize in the historical view that I'll be looking at, so from the uh, gold rush period of the mid 19th century through, uh, through the early part of the 20th century, we're largely talking about Chinese in terms of people from a single province, uh, and not only uh, that single province of China, but also one particular area uh, uh, of that province. So just, you can see marked in green there, just a handful of counties around the Pearl River Delta. Uh, and these people generally are termed uh, uh, um, Cantonese because the general province is termed Cantonese and most people, many people spoke Cantonese language, but also many people spoke other languages and dialects. Uh, and this is very important to their history. And it's also had an influence upon uh, their operatic forms. Uh, and so that's just the beginning of our uh, view in terms of what Chineseness uh, might view, might, might pertain. Uh, now, in terms of the overall history of the uh, opera in Australia, it has quite a long history. As I said before, it begins in the Gold Rush period in the 1850s. Uh, earliest uh, certain uh, performance was in Ballarat in 1856, uh, but it continued uh, right through the rest of the 19th century into the early part of the 20th century, with a peak perhaps around about the 1890s and to 1906, 1906 marking the last uh, opera that we know of in Sydney at that time. And so it said, went around the gold fields with lots of touring around the Victorian gold fields. It went to Melbourne, went to Sydney. Uh, some, uh, there was interesting performances down in Tasmania in the late 19th century. And then in particular, there were quite a large number of tours around Queensland. 
uh, at the end of the 19th century around the smaller towns of Queensland, all of which had uh, significant population, Chinese community populations. Uh, but apart from touring up and down uh, 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 the East Coast, possibly also in Darwin, although we don't have any definitive evidence there. Um, what we uh, also note about that is that uh, for some strange reason, reason I can't quite uh, um, explain, uh, there's no evidence of a Chinese opera on the New South Wales goldfields, despite the New South Wales goldfields having a fairly significant uh, Chinese population comparable to that on the Victorian goldfields. So that's just a, uh, a mystery there I throw out. And if anyone can think they can explain that, I'd like to, to hear from them. So in terms of um, how we know about uh, this opera, most of our, our information comes uh, almost entirely from European observers, uh, that we have very little uh, direct information uh, from Chinese people until towards the end of the 19th century when these Chinese language newspapers begin to be published. So what we get from the Europeans is uh, a mixed uh, observations. They're patronizing sometimes, amazed, ignorant, disgusted, sympathetic and surprised and admiring, uh, or perhaps all of these at the same time. So they, they find themselves quite uh, unable to explain sometimes exactly what's going on. But one thing they were fairly uh, consistent about was how their, uh, uh, their view of the music. And this is a fairly typical example uh, where they say, uh, on the music, without flattering the musicians, the general effect can be compared to a boiler making establishment in full work. So they'd never quite grasped uh, the music but in terms of the performance, they were much more, much more uh, uh, surprised and admiring. And one, uh, one definition that I like is, is this, that the opera sound was a sound like that which comes from a politician's head when you hit it with a stick. So that was uh, uh, one, one way of referring uh, um, uh, to the music. But in general, uh, the observations were uh, of the actual performances themselves were much more uh, admiring. So in one example here is, in carriage, men, dress and surroundings, infinitely superior to many European performers who assume the king and the crown for the nonce. Uh, another is to, to describe it as at once satisfactory and terrific or astonished and pleased. Uh, and these performances took place in a variety of uh, areas. They began in tents on the gold fields, uh, but they then soon moved into the ordinary theatres where, where European performers, Italian operas and other things took place. So there was never any major separation between these theatrical performances around Australia. And very soon, particularly in the 19th century, we have lots of evidence of English handbills being printed whenever there were performances. The managers encouraged uh, non-Chinese speakers to attend. Uh, you know, anyone, anyone paying for a seat was good. Uh, and we certainly have plenty of evidence of European uh, audience members as well. Many of these things were used for fundraising. And this is part of the, the rural tours, particularly that I mentioned in Queensland, but also in New South Wales and other areas. Uh, fundraising for hospitals and other local, uh, uh, local charities. This is a very common thing for theatrical groups to do when they were touring into country towns and the Chinese operas did the, did the same thing. So one example that I have uh, showing just how uh, this connection between the Chinese community and the wider community in the next slide. Thanks, uh, uh, Nick. Is this one uh, from Brisbane uh, in 1894 of the, uh, the Bouillon Tin Company, which was again originally based in Sydney, but was touring up to Brisbane and then continue on in, into Queensland. And here you can see the building says it's under the patronage of the Sydney University and Brisbane football teams. And I don't have any uh, uh, information or evidence about why the football teams were sponsoring a Chinese opera, um, but they did. And they actually attended the opera. Uh, and unfortunately the footballers themselves are described as being unduly boisterous. They obviously didn't catch their attention too much. And they did a lot of teasing. And this enraged some of the uh, uh, Chinese audience members who simply lost their temper completely according to a, an observer and seizing chairs charged on the tormentors who I think had to escape through a back window in the end. Uh, and so uh, we see after that, the, the uh, patronage of the football uh, footballers no longer appears on the advertising of the Boo Yun Tin. So there was quite an interesting dynamic going on there uh, within the community uh, at one stage, at least. Um, not as artistic as we might, might hope. So this is, a, a, as I say, this is a, a history. This is a performance um, uh, that was going on for generations in Australia. And the people of the 19th and early 20th century, of course, knew this and were quite familiar with this. Uh, but I have to say that nowadays we are fairly unfamiliar. Many people are quite surprised to know that Chinese opera not only uh, performed in Australia, but performed quite regularly and was quite a common uh, 
occurrence. So it was not by no means a hidden history, but it's certainly a whitewashed one. And I'd like to see that as being one of the effects of the white Australia policy, which was intent, not just on kind of reducing the non-white population of Australia, uh, particularly after 1901, uh, with the dictation test uh, and the white Australia policy in full stream through the 20th century, but also it had an effect of, re of removing from the Australian imagination the idea of non-white people. And so Chinese opera had no place in those kind of histories. How do you explain Chinese opera if you think of Australia as a white country where Chinese people and other non-white people are merely annoyances to be removed with an Immigration Restriction Act? Uh, they're only there to... Uh, uh, to kind of be part of this immigration policy or this image of Australia as a white country. So we had effectively this history has been whitewashed out and we need to bring this back in, not to show opera as a, a, an exotic art form, which it may well be, but also as something that was uh, in, in, integral to Australian history for many, uh, for many generations and perhaps uh, will be again. So this brings us to the, to, to the migrant context. In this case, uh, the picture here is of the opening of the Suyup Temple in Glebe in 1904. And naturally, when you're opening a new temple, you have plenty of performances, plenty of lion dances going on, and there's also lots of opera. And in fact, according to the report, and in this case, we have a report in a Chinese language newspaper, um, there were some 40 performances of Chinese opera over the opening weekend. Uh, these weren't full operas, of course, but they were uh, individual uh, scenes, performances, put on by 40 different groups or sponsored by 40 different groups including at least one that was done by, uh, by women, an all-women group. Uh, and this is interesting, and we'll talk a bit more about women uh, entering into this traditionally uh, male, uh, male performance art. Um, and so this is a, say, part of the wider migrant context. One, one thing to mention here is that the Suyup Temple, um, and Suyup is a particular uh, language group within the Chinese community, the, the opening of a temple in a city in, in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century was actually criticised by other members of the Chinese community, particularly the more elite merchant members of the Zhongshan, a more Cantonese speaking group, who considered that to be old culture and didn't think they were being very modern in doing this. Uh, but nevertheless, despite that uh, opposition that appeared in the newspapers, certainly the community turned out in full uh, to celebrate this particular, uh, particular event, uh, both in terms of religion and temples, I might add, along with uh, uh, opera, uh, were plentiful in Australia right through the 19th century, although there, being more physically remains that there's more awareness of that particular part of the history. And, so, and Nick, uh, you'd like to continue a little bit here? Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, following on from the idea of the migrant context based around a community structure or building, um, I would like to give you a brief insight into the Diyoju community mentioned earlier before, um, and then talk about the opera that they perform. So, <laughs> Deep in the heart of Sydney's west, in the suburb of Krabimata, very notorious area, I'm sure you, you might agree, uh, is a large freestanding Chinese style structure which may be found nestled between a residential mansion and the Sacred Heart Catholic Church. And this building is the meeting place of the Australian Chinese Teochew Association. Um, um, and it's uh, uh, frequented by diasporic Chinese hailing from Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, mainland China, and various parts various other parts of Southeast Asia. The common link is the Diochu dialect and culture, which originally comes from Diongsua or Chaosan in Guangdong province. And the man responsible for bringing the community together uh, is uh, Mr. Li Kwakong. Uh, Li he was a migrant, um, more of a refugee um, in the late 1970s. And he came to Australia, became very successful um, and was awarded the Medal of uh, the Order of Australia for his contribution to the Diochu community, um, which provides um, cultural facilities um, and a general meeting place for people of Diochu background. Now, I came across this community partially by chance. Uh, it was established in 1988, a thriving traditional stronghold with a kind of a political presence within the wider community, the karaoke club, the dancing group, which is Cha Cha, by the way, an integrated Kung Fu and line dancing school are attended by many. Um, and there are YouTube clips which reveal the popularity of this, um, this art form. Um, and as a line dancer myself, well, I'm retired now, I, I was drawn to this community first. And it was through that that I found the um, instruments lying on the stage. And so I was then intrigued to find out who played those instruments. 
and um, I will I will reveal more as we go along. But um, as an outsider, I could see that the community catered certainly for all ages within the group, um, with um, music and the performing arts as a means of cultural identification. So in terms of identity, I might hand over back to Michael now. Yes. Yeah, so just this question of identity that we talked about. Uh, for example, the uh, we talk about we're talking about what we on being labeling Chinese opera, and, and both these terms need to be qualified a little bit. Uh, for the Chinese community themselves, they didn't refer to what they were doing as Chinese opera. They referred to it by phrases such as a pear garden or the grand opera, or the big big drama, a uh, big drama rather than opera. Uh, uh, for the Chinese language newspapers, uh, that that was the case. For the European observers. They never used the term Cantonese opera, which is something that, that people might be prone to use. Uh, I said before, there were problems of, of what we call commonly call Canton. There are many Cantonese speakers among the Chinese community, but technically this wasn't Cantonese opera that hadn't yet evolved or was on the peak of evolving at the beginning of the 20th century. Instead, European observers always referred to it as Chinese opera, Chinese theater, or Chinese drama. And they might've been ignorant in using these labels, but they were accidentally quite uh, accurate. Uh, that's these are certainly better terms than Cantonese opera. In actual fact, the opera of the in Australia of the 19th century, early 20th century, was probably sung in another dialect or language, completely a Southern Mandarin, which had a kind of more prestige to it. Um, we certainly have a few clues to that, including at one point uh, a person being told, an observer being told that the actors we are informed spoke the highest Chinese. So, like Italian opera, they were using uh, a language that had a bit more. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, classical allusions to it, and people um, uh, listen to that, knowing the, knowing the plot, but without necessarily understanding every word. And also the idea of whether it, we're talking opera. We use that term, the English term opera. Um, of course, in the beginning, people weren't too sure what they were looking at, and they tended to, to focus on the acrobatic performances, the actual movement, uh, which was quite dramatic, uh, and weren't too sure whether they were actually uh, looking at uh, acrobats at one stage. But gradually, they began to realise this was a very uh, sophisticated form with lots of plots and characterizations and, and opera was seen to be the more appropriate appropriate uh, term. But again, we've, despite us using these short-term terms such as Chinese opera, we should always be careful uh, what we mean uh, by, uh, by these terms. And so, and that of course goes for the wider idea of, uh, of Chinese and Chineseness, which I'll hand over uh, to Nick. Thank you, Michael. So I continue to be intrigued by the multiplicity of identities associated with China today. Um, across the world, people identify in some way or form with China, often through the use of the hyphen, which is very convenient. Um, I just like to point out the um, bottom um, um, uh, label here refers to our very good friend, um, uh, Professor Ian Ang. And so it can get very complicated. <clears throat> so um, as a researcher, and I'm sure you're all wanting to know, um, who are these um, Tio Chu that we speak of who inhabit Western Sydney today and also other parts of the world? Um, to introduce you to this language group, um, um, Tio Chu is a Sino Tibetan tongue classified in the textbook as a dialect of Chinese. More accurately, we would say it's a dialect of the Min language group, the Min Nun group, spoken in southern Fujian, Taiwan, and across Southeast Asia. So um, it is linguistically very different to modern Mandarin with a direct connection to, they say, middle Mandarin. Um, um, so Professor Han will probably help me now demonstrate how different it is with um, how are you in Mandarin? Ni hao ma. And in Teochew is ni ho bo. And in Cantonese, le hong ma. And what about have you eaten? Chi fan le ma. In Teochew, it's ya ba bui. And in Cantonese, sick by all me. And finally, hello, my name is, and what is your name? <laughs> 你好,我的名字是,你叫什么名字?你好,我的名字是,你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你叫什么名字?你
Um, this area here, uh, I mentioned before, the Chaoshan region. Um, Teochew is currently spoken by roughly 10 million people in Chaoshan, with more than 5 million outside the Chinese mainland. So uh, this is by comparison, the mother group, the Minnan group, of course, 28 million in mainland China. And, you know, there's 3.5 in Taiwan, 2 million in Malaysia, 1 million in the Philippines. And then, of course, San Francisco, America, um, and also um, a little bit in Australia, but mostly, you know, Singapore. So it's quite a small language group by comparison. Um, so um, the ancestral homeland of the Teochew, as you know, lies in the south. And it's always, um, I guess, uh, puzzled me as to how this language group developed. And I didn't quite understand that until I went to um, university when I enrolled in modern Asian history in first year, that um, the China we know today is not the China that was once, you know, um, of the past. And if you speak to Vietnamese nationals, they'll say that the south of China, of course, were the Vietnamese, ancient Vietnamese Yue kingdoms, which eventually became the Yue language group, as you know. Um, so um, the idea is that, of course, the Teochew were a Han group from the north. Um, and they, because of warfare or for whatever political reasons, migrated south mainly in two uh, big ways. To, um, so from the Henan region, they went down to Fujian, and from Fujian they moved down to Teochew, and that's quite possibly why there is still a link between the Teochew dialect and the Mandarin dialect, uh, the Minnan dialect. So um, myself, I am, um, my grandfather is from Fujian, and so at home we speak the Minnan language. Um, my grandmother is Teochew from Indonesia, and so she speaks the Teochew dialect, and I can hear the similarities. It's, the Teochew language sounds like a kind of jazz up version of Minnan. I don't know. Anyway, it's just my impression. Um, so that, that helps. And the idea, though, is that um, um, when these people migrated south, um, they, of course, intermarried with the local Yue people. Um, so um, and that might explain also why there are, you know, substrates in the language from um, yep, non-Han, you know, um, sources, of course. And genetically, too, um, there is this chromosome in the Teochew people, which is not often found in normal, normal Han um, DNA. Okay, so um, so this is just a, a map of um, where they might reside all around the world, scattered in a way. Um, and there's been a kind of Teochew renaissance in recent decades. So people living overseas who um, perhaps don't speak Chinese very well, but suddenly very interested in the Teochew heritage. Um, there's this concept of gaki nang. Um, Kakinang means, uh, I guess in Mandarin it's like Zijiren, you know, your own people. Um, and so um, English speakers um, in, say, America or Australia, who have a Teochi heritage, trying to connect with the language, the culture. Um, interestingly, I don't see much talk about opera, but occasionally there is talk of opera. So that might give you an idea. There are, um, of course, Teochi food, you know, all those other cultural aspects come into play. Um, so just moving on here. Um, uh, maybe I thought, I thought I could share some notes from my field work. Um, so in 2004, I came across the sound of plucked and bowed strings echoing through the corridor of the um, association, which I finally found. And I was very intrigued by what music they were playing because there was no conductor. Um, the tuning was very unusual. I was trained in the Chinese classical, in a conservatory system playing the arhu. Um, and so, yes, I found that firstly, modally, it was a very strange sound world, yet, I could recognize um, the instruments in a way. I knew what they were, but I, but were they what I thought they were, you know, these instruments? Um, and also um, the fact that um, the complete, the performance practice was, it seemed totally different. You know, they were poker faced. They were almost, you know, um, reminiscing. It seemed like they were reminiscing about something. Um, and so um, that was my introduction to the TOG sound world. What I found later on was they were rehearsing um, a type of string ensemble music which accompanies the sung arias. So these are all men, there are no singers at the moment, they're practicing, say, uh, musical interludes between scenes or the accompaniment to, to vocal passages. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so just moving on to the. Um, certainly, um, having done the field work in hindsight, um, I've come to apply this sort of as a con uh, conceptual framework that music played in this community can be used as a means by which um, these men associate with their Teochewness. Not so much Chinese identity in general, but they're very specific about Teochew, you know, Teochew Nang, their own people. 
Um, and so um, you'll see as we continue to speak, um, and this applies very much to Michael's work too, that um, music has a very strong link to identity. And we'll speak more about this later on, of course. This is um, Ao Yong in, in Chinese, or Veng. Um, he is one of my main informants in the community. And Veng is very interesting because he maintains his dual Vietnamese Chinese identity in the Kaaba Massa area. And like many diasporic Teochew from Southeast Asia, he's fluent in various languages, Vietnamese, Teochew, Cantonese, Mandarin. Um, he does not speak English though, which is very interesting. So he lives in this ethnic ghetto in Kaaba Massa and runs an informal DVC, VCD and DVD duplication business um, from home. And he specifically tells me that he does not go to Woolworths because they don't have to speak English. So he's kind of an interesting character. Um, he's not trained as a musician, but is a Teochew opera fanatic. And he learns Teochew opera from um, these instructional VCDs, which he also helps duplicate for um, community members. So there's nothing, there's no issue about copyright here. And um, so for him, um, I'm, I'm just summarizing from my notes here, but for him, um, performing this music really brings him um, gives him a sense of being part of an international Teochew community. So it's a kind of transnational feeling for him when he sings Teochew opera. And he enjoys performing it with another community member, an older lady called Daisy. So they've been rehearsing this duet for a long, long time. Uh, unfortunately, because of a flood, I, I, um, I cannot show you the recording I made. I, I've lost the recording because of water damage. But, um, but definitely it's a very sweet aria and um, they um, certainly there's a sort of, sort of a group bonding effect which other scholars like Frederick Lau have, to, have talked about, about singing Chinese songs in Bangkok and other places um, where you kind of, um, it's, I guess it's a mixture of nostalgia, um, it's a little bit of a branding sort of process taking on um, and um, it's very interesting because in the traditional context, Teochew opera is actually performed in, um, in temples and also for um, religious occasions, um, whereas here it's a, a purely social um, event and um, I think therein lies a lot of the power of music as well. Um, and of course, there is an interesting role in which women often play the star, you know, they often have this, um, rarely do they play the instruments. So on the note of women, I might hand over back to Michael. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, yeah so women uh, are interesting in, in the context of Chinese opera because traditionally, uh, like uh, uh, operas in, a, in Europe also at one stage, um, women didn't perform. Uh, instead, uh, women's roles were performed by, uh, by men. Uh, and so we've got some uh, observations on that, of course. Um, so people were impressed with the, the youths who took the parts of the ladies concerned were capitally made up and certainly their voices would never betray their sex. So they were quite aware that there, there, were, there were men playing these parts, but others were a little bit disappointed in that. Unfortunately, uh, are not the women, uh, look, they look uncommonly flat, seemingly apparently have no idea of padding. Uh, so they're not too sure, um, uh, not, not, not very enthused about, about this. But we do have um, evidence that not only did women begin to perform, and this is a, a, an evolution that's happening within this context of adapting, uh, in America, for example, they often try and take the credit for women first appearing in Chinese opera in San Francisco. But I think this is more a case the Americans not, of course, regarding Australia at all, because we do have evidence of the similar thing happening in Australia. And not just Chinese women on the stage, but European women. And we have one performance at least, uh, where supposedly it's recorded that eight Western beauties dancing like swallows with full makeup appeared before an audience in Sydney over many nights in 1898. Now, this is actually recorded in the uh, Chinese language newspaper, but there's no mention of this in, a, in an English language newspaper, um, which is uh, unusual because you would have thought something uh, as, as interesting, this might would have been reported, but presumably there was just nobody, no European newspaper person around at that time. Um, we also have a report of the opera troupe, uh, the Liao Tian Ban, of 10 Western actors. Uh, again, we're not too sure whether that's women or women and men. Are performing in a, in a performance. So there was evidence here of change and, and adaption uh, uh, and women becoming more, uh, uh, more present uh, within, this, uh, within this context. And uh, Nick, yes, right. 
Thank you, Michael. On the topic of women still, um, back in Teochew land, um, I mentioned that they often don't play the instruments while um, um, they often have a role as, say, the vocalist in an aria or um, in a duet situation. However, when it comes to uh, music that is not strictly related to opera, um, for instance, um, in the community centre, um, although they are opera lovers, they also play music from, say, just uh, f the folk genre in particular, the folk genre or classical Chinese music, which is not really operatic. Um, certainly, opera tunes do make their way into classical uh, genres. Um, and also, they have a love for Cantonese opera, um, that being some of them being fluent in both languages. And so this particular excerpt is... Um, um, one of the community members singing an, uh, a well-known aria, which you heard at the start of this talk, um, which comes from Sacrifice of the Princess Ji um, Hua, um, about the uh, the end of the Ming Dynasty when the um, Qing, you know, um, soldiers were approaching the capital and the couple commit suicide. So it's one of those mm. something about a suicide, you know, on the on the, on the eve of your marriage that sort of um, inspires a lot of people <laughs> to reminisce. Um, so um, women do play a part in opera, even though you may get the uh, idea that it is quite, you know, um, I guess, patriarchal in that sense. Um, um, Australia's very first Teochew opera star is Prudence Roberts. Um, and she, she has gone to a lot of trouble to learn the art form. It's very hard to learn in Australia because um, there are not many teachers. In, they do invite teachers over, but if you want to really, really learn to perform, um, then she's travelled over to Singapore, which is in many ways the nearest Teochew stronghold to Australia. Um, you could go to Hong Kong or other places, but I guess Singapore's just as good. Um, and um, also then we have um, a 15-year-old who has decided to learn the music, um, Tan Wei Tian, um, also um, performing away in Singapore there. So um, in, in terms of this, um, I would like to say that not many young people are interested in this art form. And that might contribute then to the sense that perhaps this genre is um, is um, is dying. So we'll see what Michael has to say about decline. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. So decline, of course, is a is an inevitable part of any progression and change. And we certainly see a decline in uh, Chinese opera in Australia at the beginning of the twentieth century. And it seems to fade away. In fact, as I said before, nineteen hundred and six. Is the last evidence we have for a, for a full opera performance uh, in Sydney. So it disappeared quite quickly uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and I think this is more a fashion change. There, were, there was evidence of people not being willing to go to the opera, not willing, being willing to pay, and only would go when the, some sponsor paid for the performance and the actual performance was free for those coming in the door. Uh, and uh, I think this is part of the reason for uh, the evolution of China, uh, Cantonese opera which takes place more in Hong Kong and San Francisco in the early part of the 20th century. Um, but we do have some evidence of, of Chinese music, at least and other things coming, going on into the 20th century. So for example, there was a live musical performance uh, for the silent film, The High Binders, which was a uh, film about Chinese Chinatown in San Francisco in 1915. And a Chinese opera, uh, opera musical band was, was um, asked to play. And this offended the, um, the, the, the musicians union at the time. Uh, later on, there's something that was cl classified as the Melbourne Chinese Orchestra that played a supporting role for a 1932 film of the Sentimental Bloke, so a very Australian film there uh, with its Chinese uh, orchestra. Uh, and then in the 1930s, we have a little bit of trace of opera still surviving in the memory, this time within the mainstream uh, society. So basically, there's no opera in the 1930s actually being performed in Australia that we know of, but you do have people uh, making a mention of it in their vernacular. Uh, so, for example, political manipulations of the day are compared to a stage hands of a Chinese opera. To say, people moving moving chairs and tables around on a, on a, on a stage, uh, or a noisy event is described as a din that a Chinese opera company would cut, give half a slice to accomplish. So, again, there's this memory, a folk memory, as you like, uh, uh, within, uh, particularly in Queensland, uh, of, of opera having once existed, despite academics failing to record this in their histories. Written, uh, written in this period. Thanks, uh, Nick, if you want to continue on. Thank you, Michael. So in terms of this decline, is this happening now to the Teochew music scene in Sydney? Um, certainly, uh, I just thought some of you might be interested in seeing some of the instruments from the string ensemble I mentioned. And as a fiddle player, I thought I'd just show you some of the different variants. 
Um, I forgot to say earlier that when I first introduced myself to the ensemble as a researcher from the university, they immediately said, we don't play Shanghai music. So, um, and oh. so I, I found this to be very true because, of course, the music we play is, you know, Mandarin is like, oh, yeah, which is a kind of national music that was the Chinese orchestra. And that's not what, that's not what they do. It made it very clear to me. And it would take me a lifetime to learn their culture. So I said, okay, I'm very happy to try my best. And, um, and I, I, they, they let me have a go on the fiddles. And I found them completely, you know, different because different tuning, um, different performance technique, everything was different. Um, so um, some people call it a fossilized genre. I'd never played these modes before. So thank you to um, uh, Mercedes Dijunko from America who went down, um, went to the trouble of transcribing the modes. And um, of course now all our um, learning is different in terms of what scales we play in the conservatory system. So um, certainly that has been developing very um, healthily because many people learn this what is now you know the Guoya, the national music of China. But what about this Diochu music? So, um, at first glance, um, perhaps it is doing okay. Um, well, it was doing okay. It seemed to be in nineteen um, eighty eight um, in this brochure here um, with quite a few uh, musicians involved. Um, however, when I was doing my field work um, in two thousand and four, the numbers had dropped a little bit. And so, and bear in mind these are all retired men. They're retired um, and often they, they, they come for a rehearsal every Wednesday and there's a bit of tea drinking, chess playing, and then they play some music, you know. And often um, what I hear now is that, um, oh, so-and-so is, uh, this is 2004, I think, so-and-so um, is sick. Oh, no. Oh, he died, you know. So so we're getting to a point where uh, we're, we're unsure about Mr. Huang here. It seems that he's the leader. The person who plays the highest fiddle is the leader here. So, um, yeah, he's, um, we, we get this idea that perhaps it is, um, it, it's, it's on, on its way out. So, um, and, um, and we're worried because um, um, the young generation are certainly not learning it. Also, um, there seems to be a, a preference for, say, um, you know, popular music, um, in particular, cha-cha music. Most people find it much easier to relate to. And also this sin menu, most people seem to like this, um, you know, uh, sort of contemporary classical music. Um, it seems to be more popular. And of course, with the non-Chinese speaking, you know, younger generation, um, well, they don't touch any of this stuff, you know, so they, they, they listen to mainstream popular music mostly. So um, um, so that's, that's our concern with this genre right now anyway. Um, so um, is there a chance for revival? Um, so perhaps there is. So Michael perhaps can talk about persistence in this instance. Yes. So, uh, so we talked about decline a little bit in the beginning of the 20th century, but there is persistence and a revival, in fact. So in 90, in 90, by the 1940s, we find that Chinese opera begins to uh, re-enter uh, the Australian scene. This is partly because of the end of Japanese war, uh, the Chinese community is seeking to raise funds. It's time to help China uh, uh, in this war uh, and also to, to uh, enliven the Australian community more about the needs uh, 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 at this time. And so you've got a, a number of performances appearing in the, in the 1940s, often presented by uh, sailors, seamen. So the Chinese Seamen's Union, which is made up mainly of people who are coming off the boats that can no longer return to China or to Hong Kong because of the Japanese occupation. There are uh, uh, refugees in Australia and now they're organising. And one of the things they organise is uh, operas. And they recognise that opera hadn't been in Australia for a while. Uh, one of them is billed as being the first full-length Chinese opera to be heard in Australia for over 50 years. Uh, the other aspect of this is that the Chinese Youth League uh, forms, uh, and this is an organisation that also presents opera. It's also an organisation with political links, left-wing political links, and this brings in an element of politics uh, that perhaps hasn't been part of the opera scene uh, previously uh, in Australia. And this uh, continues on into the, uh, uh, into the Cold War period where we have uh, not only the uh, Youth League, which is being spied on regularly by Asia at this time, but also performing uh, what's now more recognizably Cantonese opera. Uh, but we also have um, uh, another opera, this time uh, Peking opera, arriving in Australia uh, in 1956. And this finds, finds itself for the first time embroiled in some political machinations, particularly to do with the, um, the fact that the 1956 is also the year of the uh, Melbourne Olympics. And so what we have 
is Menzies suddenly arrives on the scene. And Menzies, to everyone's surprise, actually tries to ban uh, this Chinese opera, or at least to delay its arrival. Uh, and he takes the flak for this. But in reality, it's a more interesting story. Um, what we have, you know, the only newspaper that actually reports it accurately is the Tribune, uh, the City Morning Herald and other great mainstream newspapers, of course, toe the line. What's actually happening behind the scene is that the U US Embassy is horrified at this aspect of Chinese soft diplomacy in 1956, and they threatened to boycott uh, the Melbourne Olympics. And so the Melbourne Olympic Committee, of course, you can imagine gets quite fraught about this, and they uh, lobby Menzies quite strongly. And the result is that the opera is delayed in New Zealand for a while, and eventually does come to Australia, but isn't allowed uh, to arrive anywhere near uh, to coincide with the Melbourne uh, Olympics. But the Embassy of China, with meaning, of course, the uh, Chinese uh, of the Republic of China, of Taiwan, uh, declares that this opera has no intrinsic merit. But I think uh, uh, that's probably not true. And certainly the Canberra Times reported that this Chinese opera rivals that of the Western world. So once again, uh, the opera in Australia is impressing people and, and, and people are encouraged. And so from this point on, there's more of a revival. And we have quite a number of opera troops, opera groups operating in, in, uh, in Australia right from the 1960s through to the end of the 20th century. Uh, they're a little bit different from those earlier on. They tend to be mostly taking place in community venues within the community, uh, and they're not really uh, very, uh, the mainstream uh, Australian society isn't perhaps too aware of what's going on, uh, not as perhaps as, as they were in the 19th and 20th century. So a little bit of a different there, uh, at least in this period of time. But gradually things begin to change, and by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we find, uh, 21st century rather, we find uh, Nick, if we can go to the next slide. Thanks. Uh, we find, uh, again, some of the performances, this is, again, Cantonese opera, uh, is being performed, again, in mainstream theatres, such as the, the Seymour Centre and others. And so we've had quite a number of performances uh, in the last uh, several years uh, that were um, had surtitles um, becoming much more common, so people could follow in English as well as in the Chinese. So, so um uh, so again, the possibilities of people of a wider, uh, a wider cultural heritage just becoming more involved or getting to know uh, this art form, whether that will continue on, of course, uh, only, only time will tell. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Michael. In a similar way, uh, we have uh, productions uh, that engage the wider community in the Teochew community, produced by the Teochew community, um, despite, I guess, um, the sense that it is declining. Um, there is, say, um, continued contact with overseas Teochew communities where there are performers who are available to come to Australia to perform. And often um, the case is that they will do it once a year. So this one is, say, the 2015 Chinese New Year event um, at Sydney Town Hall. Um, which I believe is the year of the goat. And so um, we have this excerpts, uh, we have excerpts from this um, well-known classic tale of the warrior horse, San Mao Guli. Uh, so we have here, um, perhaps you'd like to actually hear what this music sounds like, because we've been talking a lot about it, or we haven't heard anything. So um, there is a bit of time, I believe, we've got about 10 minutes. So I'll play a little bit of an excerpt from this solo um, extract. Yeah. And so apart from these um, events that engage the wider community, there are, of course, um, ethno-specific events more targeted at those who are within the uh, teacher community in Sydney. Here we have um, an operatic excerpt here. So certainly um, opera still plays an important role in defining, I guess, to the group what Teotihuacan means. Um, and um, despite the fact that there are no, I guess, uh, children learning the opera, as far as I know, apart from that 15-year-old um, that we talked about. Um, perhaps it, it may still continue. Um, so uh, I, I thought I'd end with this um, famous uh, idiom, which also makes sense in Mandarin. Um, 
similar to the Shakespearean quote about life being a stage. But um, Teochew's consanguinity and culture will undoubtedly be celebrated, I think, for the next several generations at least within the greater Chinese diaspora. Uh, Teochew opera, perhaps without the appeal that food or popular might popular music might have for the younger generation is certainly faced with a serious ch challenge, especially in the Sydney community, but with the support of um, performers and um, like-minded people in Southeast Asia and also mainland China, I think we can be uh, confident um, in the fact that we will continue to have Teochew Opera in Sydney for the time being, um, even if it's not always performed by local performers. Uh, so uh, that's my um, summary of, uh, of uh, today's um, topic. And maybe I'll hand it over to Michael to see if he has any further comments. Oh, thanks, Nick. Um, not really. I think, I think we can leave it uh, at this point. I mean, uh, we've tried, I think, today to try and see the historical and the contemporary and the ethnographic and uh, bringing it together. Whether we've been successful in doing that, of course, we'll have to leave to our audience. But thank you very much for uh, uh, collaborating with me on this, uh, on this presentation today. Thank you, Michael. And thank you, Professor Han, for the invitation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Michael and Anik. I found this fascinating. It's really interesting to see from the very beginning and disappear and the revive and then, you know, contemporary. I found it really fascinating. It's just uh, something that are uh, very interesting as a migrant, you know, I, I came in in my 20s. Um, I found this part, you know, many parts is sort of, um, I can see the history, but uh, this part, I feel like it's something I missed when I grew up in China. Because of, um, in those days, the 70s and the 60s, there were no uh, local operas who were allowed because they belonged to one of the olds. So it's really interesting to see that. And then so reminds me, or I mean, what reminds me coincidentally, I just watched this show called Tito Doll, which I posted on chat on Netflix. I was made in Singapore by Singapore um, uh, TV company. Uh, it's about, you know, uh, local opera, Wanyang uh, opera in Singapore, and then in 30s and 60s, uh, 30s, 20s and 30s, so thriving and then eventually declining. But now they are actually based on the true story of a Wanyang star and made this drama series. I was fascinated by watching that series and because I see the drama, you know, local opera growing from just see them perform and the way they speak, the, the way they move, uh, I found it fascinating. It's really interesting. And uh, now I, we have a, quite a few questions and then let's go through the questions. Uh, first of all, it's Juanita. Juanita saying, hello, Nick. Uh, apparently you two met in 2001 at the Sydney Asia Pacific Film Festival, which I know of as well. That was when I know Juanita. So I didn't realize, Nick, you were there recording the soundtrack for them. So, yeah. Oh, yes, that was my first year out of uni. I think I just I took a year <laughs> off. Just before I started my PhD, I took a year off. And um, yes. um, that's wonderful. Thank you, Juanita, for joining yes, us. Yes, what a small world. Anyway, so Juanita, that's another reason you need to come to do a talk at this place, you know. So <laughs> you can't avoid an album for another, for another reason. And um, uh, Dinah made a comment, music critics at this time, because uh, the, uh, Michael mentioned the music comments about the Chinese opera, quite, you know, a bit of a frank and rude. Uh, music uh, critics at this time were also very frank and rude about European performances and music too, especially new music. So these comments from members of the public are probably in style for the time. That was a comment. Michael, do you have anything to say that? I think it's, it's good to point that out. Yes, I mean, the, the, this journalistic style uh, in the 19th century was pretty uh, jocular and, 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 and inclined to be very uh, uh, dismissive and patronising of a whole range of peoples. And so you could, of course, pick out bits and pieces related to the Chinese and say, oh, they're being very racist. Uh, they definitely were, but, uh, but yes, uh, given the, the general tone of, of, of journalism, often it really wasn't that much different. They could hand out insults uh, to a range of people. But I think in terms of the music, there was something that was a bit harder for them to, uh, to get around uh, um, in that specific instance. But yes, certainly the, the, the general uh, reportage varied a lot and, and it's worth having a look at it. It's quite, it's quite interesting how people, uh, how people reported on these things. Some people did make more an effort to understand, others 
you could see they just had their minds made up before they even walked in the door. But that's typical of journalists and reporters at, at, at any time. There, there, there are variations, of course, and you need to, to look out for those. Mm. I'm curious to know from Monique, you know, the contemporary uh, comments, you know, people, uh, because you're doing a lot of contemporary work, do people make comments about the Chinese opera music, you know, that what sort yes. of comments? Yes, I mean, obviously, you can't publish a newspaper article with, you know, um, negative um, comments like those from the, um, you know, 19th century. But um, I think I think these days a lot of younger musicians have heard about Chinese opera and there's a fascination with the sound world. So I find they're very um, enthusiastic about, you know, the different... Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, there are, there are the ongoing jokes about, you know, you know, cats being killed and etc. But it's um, <laughs> um, yeah. But there's a fascination and intrigue. I think it, it's it's wonderful to see. Mm. Yeah. I mean, you know, I didn't grow up with an uh, opera, a Chinese opera, but I think you know, once when I was at SBS, I did 13 episodes of P Miss Pioneer. Oh. Uh, you know, that was a P uh, Quinchu. At the beginning, I found it a bit difficult to like, but at the end of the 13 episodes, I definitely fell in love with the music. It's so beautiful. I think it needs to take a bit of time to get to know and understand and then used to it. So, yeah. The next question from Sophie asking about them. Uh, Michael, do you still see that as some, uh, you know, recent Australian history writings are still whitewashing history? Because I have a similar question is when you mentioned about whitewashing. I was wondering how, why and, you know, like what's behind this whitewashing opera? And then if you can answer, answer Sophie's question about the East Australian writings do whitewashing. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's fairly instinctive, I think. I think in the early 20th century, it was just about people's image of what Australia was. And so they tried very hard. They were very serious about this whole white Australia policy business. And they were, they were very, content, very concerned that Australia was going to be a particular image and so, China, and so when people were writing their history or, or writing about Australia, they just, uh, like all historians of people too, they, they, they just didn't quite see things very, very, uh, very clearly. They weren't looking for it, basically. Uh, and so uh, Chinese existed as opium smokers or as people to kind of trying to get around the, uh, the immigration laws and smuggling themselves on ships. So they saw that obvious biz business that was mentioned occasionally. But in terms of the kind of narrative of Australian history, they didn't see it. They saw it as white people coming to Australia. I mean, Aborigines very rarely got a, a look in on, on some parts of Australian history in the uh, uh, 20th century. I mean, they were quite uh, uh, they were writing a history for themselves, uh, and they weren't really interested in um, uh, anything that disturbed that narrative. That was how it was in the 20th century. Like later on now, I'd like to say that there's the, there's, there's no whitewashing now, but unfortunately, I think it's still very much exists within history, particularly mainstream China history. Um, of course, there is this uh, harder core of Chinese Australian historians who are, who are busily trying to bring this history out, uh, uh, but they, they're still a bit isolated. They're still a bit specialists and you still get, you don't get uh, uh, this, this greater knowledge of, of Chinese Australian history uh, permeating the mainstream as much as I'd like. It, it does in a sense of um, people talking about migrant history and victims and, you know, there's an anti-racism thread there that will mention uh, um, Australian history in, in, a, in a different way, um, uh, but that's still a bit tokenistic. It doesn't quite integrate the full uh, range of the history. I mean, I would like to get to a point where Chinese opera in Australia in the 19th century is mentioned as a matter of course, rather than something uh, exotic. But on the other hand, that it get mentioned at all would be a good thing. So, so yes, things are better, but I think there's still a, lot, a great deal of whitewashing going on. And a lot of this has to do with people's mindsets and what they think of as Australia, what does it mean? And, and, uh, and for the academia, academia, it's 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 uh, whiteness is still embedded in there um, uh, far too much. Uh, but the, the things are changing. There are, I know there's a lot of really good uh, young uh, PhDs coming along uh, doing work, and I think when you know as they uh, mature, uh, things will change quite rapidly in the next uh, next generation or so. Certainly, I hope so. Well, talking about a young generation and an extra crop of a PhD, that's a Chris. So Chris has a question too. So Chris has said, uh, it's a very interesting talk. I'm interested um, uh, to know if the narratives of a Chinese opera in Australia was in any way influenced by the migration experience. 
For example, do you have evidence of the kind of stories portrayed in Chinese opera in Australia for an Australian audience? Oh, and yeah, so that's, that's how they were different to those in the place of origins. So both of you can answer. Michael, uh, you go first. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, I have considered that. It's very hard to figure out what the plots were because we're we're, we're relying on the European observers. Um, you know, they do describe the plots occasionally, but the, it's it's hard to pick what they are. Uh, there are a few of them are, are, are fairly obvious traditional plots, uh, the White Snake story, and, and a few like that. Um, others don't seem to make any sense at all. There is one interesting uh, report of a plot that was supposedly about a European governor. Um, and that would imply uh, exactly that, that they were modifying the plots to, to bring in contemporary history. If that was true, it might well be some reflection of the Opium War or something of that nature. Uh, but it's only just this phrase about a European governor uh, fighting a war within this plot. So, so there's a hint there that, yes, that's exactly what was happening. But there's not really a lot of evidence uh, about that, um, which probably did, could do a bit more work. I've tried to send out these plot descriptions to opera experts around the world, and they usually aren't very good at figuring out what the what the hell these plots were. One was supposedly about uh, about the future, um, uh, even it's like, kind of like a science fiction opera. But um, uh, again, I don't have any uh, uh, enough details to figure out whether that was a common a common thing uh, or not. So I think we could, we could do a lot more work. Unfortunately, because we don't have the Chinese sources, it makes it very difficult because the European obser observations are just too too garbled uh, to give us uh, give us a very clear uh, very clear picture. Mm, indeed. Um, Nick, do you have anything to add to that question? I, I don't actually, um, in terms of traditional opera, but um, currently what is happening now is a new dramatic work. Um, and I can't tell you when it's being released. It's a secret, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a dramatic piece um, inspired by um, an operatic production that apparently took place in Hatches Creek in, in Northern Territory in 1942. And um, it was um, a group of miners who had put together an opera. Um, and so someone else now is running a show based on this event. So, but that's not really exactly what we're talking about, but slightly related. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, Tammy has a comment um, saying that the CSU's Cantonese uh, opera at the Sydney Town Hall funded the radical documentary film Indonesia Calling in the 40s, made by Choris. Horace Evans. Anyone do you want to make any comment or? Just... Oh yes, that was a very interesting film, which you can see on YouTube uh, if you want to see that. Uh, it was a made to kind of uh, highlight, yeah, because the Chinese Simmons Union got involved with the Dutch, uh, uh, the Indonesian resistance to the Dutch uh, trying to recolonize uh, after the end of World War uh, World War Two. So the Chinese Simmons Union was quite. Quite radical and was involved uh, in helping a lot of those those um, uh, um, uh, programs, including, of course, as as was generally the Australian Seamen as well, the Wharf Labourers Union and so forth, were also involved in that kind of activity. Uh, the film, yeah, is quite interesting one uh, made by a Dutch um, uh, a Dutch phenomenon, uh, and you can see quite interesting scenes of Sydney there, and even Arthur Arthur Chang at one point um, uh, giving a giving a talk, uh, although he's miss I think he's mislabeled. It's Fred Wong, but it's actually Arthur um, in in that in that film. But it, it's worth looking up, uh, and I'm pretty sure it's not, it's available on YouTube. Mm. Uh, Chen Chen, just to say hello to my co-owner. Nice to meet you, Nick. Uh, next, a question from Jared. Jared says, um, "Hello, my co-owner Nick. Thanks for the talk. Really enjoyed it. I would like to ask about the role of the Australian government. What are their involvements in the promotion of a Chinese opera today?" Financially, government-owned media, etc., compared to back in the nineteenth century. Maybe Nick can start. Oh yes. As far so, as um, mm. I, I don't really know much about the um, role of the government per se. Although, um, and nineteenth century is obviously Michael's expertise, but certainly um, when the Tiochu have an operatic production, they are very careful to invite um, local politicians um, because there's always, um, you know, funding may be possibilities, but also they want to be known, you know, they, they're very proud of who they are and what they do. And so there's usually some politician who'll, who'll have to sit through, you know, maybe 
most of the production and then they may leave afterwards. Mm -hmm. Often they come for a photo, you know, and so. Are you um, aware so, of their financial uh, sponsor, you know, support to Chinese opera? These yeah, days? I'm, I don't know. I don't have um, that much knowledge, but uh, I do know, firstly, a lot of the money came from Mr. Lai, Mr. Mm -hmm. Lee. Mm -hmm. who, who set up the whole thing. He's the main, um, uh, but then they also have um, community backing. Um, but in terms of government sponsorship, I'm not quite sure yet. Mm. Uh, Michael, do you have anything to add or you were aware of any funding? No, I'm not aware of any mm. government funding. Traditionally, these, yeah, these performances are uh, supported by private, mm. use a wealthy merchant or a wealthy fundraiser or someone like that. I know there was an opera company here in the 80s mm. in Sydney that was supported by the owner of the, of the of the new, of the Chinese language newspaper, for example, and ran for about ten years, and they had their their performance uh, um, rehearsal space upstairs above the newspaper offices, and that was the way. That's usually the way it plays out. So I, I'm not aware of much in the way of government funding um, uh, for mm. these things. Okay, uh, last two questions before we finish. Uh, Daniel, Daniel said, "I'm aware of a newsletters published by the Zhongshan Association, historically shared." Uh, both uh, amongst the Chinese community in Australia and back in Zhongshan, Guangdong. I wonder if you might have explored the Chinese language media from the 19th century to early 20th century regarding the Cantonese opera. Uh, I have looked at newspapers in, in China, in Zhongshan. Uh, unfortunately, that was many years ago. Well, they closed the library down and we couldn't get access to those newspapers anymore. For a while, but um, I wasn't looking for opera at that time, um, so I haven't I haven't seen anything. Uh, there was plenty of there was plenty of talk uh, about you know what was happening in Australia, what was happening in China and in Zhongshan. Uh, it would be fascinating to look at those newspapers again and to see if in fact they were mentioning anything to do with opera or other things. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether we have access to those newspapers uh, again uh, at the moment. We're waiting for the library to be built. Um, so the, the sources are there, potentially are there, but, uh, but I, I myself haven't seen anything directly in China about opera in Australia, uh, but there is, it possibly is, is something there and it would be worth uh, someone like Chris, for example, who um, is younger than me and can go back to China when he gets a chance and have a look when that library finally opens and, and that precious resource opens once again. This is specifically newspapers printed in Zhongshan and about Zhongshan, which are there in the Zhongshan library, um, local library. Um, quite a few of them. Uh, there may be more, of course, uh, uh, in other parts of China mm. as well. Yeah, it's a good question, a good response. Tiffany Wang just wants to know, uh, Michael, he wants to have, she wants to have your email address because uh, she said, I have a pitch to, to stage a traditional Chinese script next year, but with some experimental ideas combining her background in Western theater. So. Maybe you can type your um, email address in the in the answer. Yes. Uh, last one is Colin. Hello, Colin. Right. Colin is a Peking opera expert. Thank you for the talk, which was very informative and enlightening. It is an interesting and important topic. All the best to Colin. So we really enjoyed Colin's last talk with us about the Peking opera uh, mm. compared with the Western opera. So we need to get him back to talk about it. Last one I have to read out, maybe it's a question. <laughs> John Clark, John said, are there any Chinese composers in Australia of the importance of Cho Wen Chuang, who was the student of Edgar Barras in New York? Is the structure for Australian conserv conservatorian course an impediment um, to their development despite some Singaporean context? Nick probably knows. Oh, yes. Um, so in terms of Chinese composers in Australia of um, that sort of status, uh, there is Julian Yu in Melbourne, uh, who's a bit of an icon, and he's quite well known for using traditional instruments in his compositions too. Um, in terms of um, conservatory courses, um, hmm, um, so um, so before I joined Western, um, I, I, I was um, helping with the Chinese Music Ensemble program at Sydney Conservatorium. In fact, I still in my spare time help direct the orchestra, um, and we have written an article about this. So maybe, I'll, uh, maybe I, you know, in terms of time, maybe I can share this with you um, offline, you know. And um, but that is a very interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so I think it's uh, lots of interesting questions. So we will have to leave it to the next time.
Thank you so much again, Michael and Nick, for this really very interesting enlightening talk. Uh, just letting everyone to know that the next lecture will be on Chinese merchants in the Northern Territory and the formations of a white Australia uh, 1880 to 1950 by Dr. Natalie Fong on 30th of September. We will send out the fly beforehand. And uh, we have also lined up speakers for October and November. We will start series of three in 2020. So uh, 2022. So if you would like to speak at a series of three, please send to me your proposals on any aspect of a Chinese Australian history. Lena, perhaps you can send to my email in the chat. So uh, you, yeah, please um, or, or welcome your proposals. So you can see that uh, everyone has expertise in certain area and the one we share them, they're just uh, fascinating and really, really interesting. So thanks. Uh, to also to Lena, who is uh, coordinating all this behind the scene, and thank you all to the audience. Um, hope to see you in, in uh, at our next lecture, and to keep well, stay safe. Thank you, and a good evening. Hey, thank you, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Bye -bye. Michael, and Bye -bye. thank you, Nick. Thank you.